Before I introduce County Executive Kittleman, I want to tell you that um, he's using this forum as his town hall meeting, which I think is outstanding. And that's why you have his people over here. This is being videotaped. Um, and what's going to happen is next year, in all likelihood, we're going to be changing venues. We're going to get a larger venue and we'll be having his town hall meeting in a different area and using HCCA as that. And that's deep, deeply appreciated. And there's another quote by Winston Churchill that I want you all to remember while Mr. Kittleman is answering our 21 questions. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, they get, the, the first, first one is definitely gonna be easy. Uh, and then they get a little bit more difficult. But Winston, Chur Winston Churchill's quote is, quote, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. So people remember that, please, okay? So without a doubt, I want you, I introduce you to County Executive Kittleman. I'll be asking the questions. Okay, thank you, Stu. Just a couple things first I want to say. Um, First of all, it's great to be with you again. Secondly, we have other folks here. You know, when they introduce folks who were elected officials previously, sometimes we forget about some of them, and some have served us well, too. Ginny Thomas is back there. She's a former council person and delegate. And while we often recognize Liz, we don't always recognize Lloyd. And Lloyd Knoll is also a former council member. See, we're all family. He actually ran against my father one time, but we still like each other. Everything's good. Um, now, it's important. No, seriously, that's what's so good about Howard County. I have great respect for Liz and Lloyd, and, and, and it doesn't matter about what's happened. We always work together, and that's what's so important. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, and I appreciate Stu, I, I kind of contacted him just like a week ago, and I said, I think it'd be really nice if we could have our new acting superintendent of schools attend. And just to say a few words to you as well, because I think it's an awesome time in our county, and I think he's brought a breath of fresh air. So if you don't mind, I'd like to have Dr. Martorano come. I just want him to come up and say something. Go ahead. I'm on a talk show here. This is a huge microphone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, I should say. It is an absolute honor to be here uh, to serve as your acting superintendent. Uh, our school system is a wonderful, cherished organization that takes care of our 56,000 young people every day. Hearing all the dedication regarding our aspect of our taxpayer dollars, we recognize the significance of our, of our school system and the dollars which support that every day. I'm honored to join on at a, very, a time when we've had great transition in the last several weeks. I'm on day 11. I really don't know what day it is, so just point me in the right direction as we move forward. But this is a time of urgency, a time of great response needed for our young people. As right now, as I've engaged in the school system, uh, to make certain that our budget is fully balanced to meet the needs of our young people as we move forward. I thank our county executive, I thank our county council, because our total school system budget right now is $819 million. That's a lot of money to educate our young people, but we've been accustomed to a high-quality educational system where our children are competing at the very highest levels every day. We need to make certain that all young people are achieving. And so I'm going to be leading with a, a very strong, robust agenda about equity, making certain that not some young people are achieving, but all young people are achieving, and in joining all of our county members uh, in this very robust journey. I'm greatly concerned about a number of different aspects as we continue to work together over the next several months. Uh, about some of the concerns of which I have, which we can do better. I'm greatly concerned right now about equity in general, but also concerned about our CTE program, our career development program. We acknowledge that we want all of our young people to go on to college, but not all of our young people are going to do that. So how do we respond to those young people who need some different pathways and some different options? I've had some wonderful conversation with our elected official about that. I know I've been blessed with the gift of gab, and I know a lot of folks have been talking tonight, so I'm going to quickly try to exit, but I do want to say that I lived in Howard County for 20 years. 
They say you can never come home, but I feel like I'm coming home. And the welcome has just been overwhelmingly emotional, reconnecting with friends, family, teachers who taught my children uh, in the school system. And I'm here to serve the children of Howard County. I lead with a pure heart. I'm here to do nothing but to help our children. Thank you for your support and just give me a chance to make the school system better than what it already is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monterano. It, it, it really has been a pleasure to work with him. I know the council's got to know him very well over their many work sessions over the last couple of weeks. So, so it's good. So I don't, if you want to start off with the questions. As I, as I mentioned, there are 21 questions and, and that we received. And um, the first, I told you, the, the, the first one is going to be easier and then they get tougher. Okay. So the first question I have for you, Alan, is what's your favorite organization? <laughs> Howard County Citizens Association. Gosh. And my father's a former president way, way back, back wow. when. Yeah. So can you can go home now. Okay, that, thank you very much. It's been great you being got, with you. You got 100%. You got 100% on that. Okay. The question is the first one. You said that was the first one. Well, the second one. Okay. Good. You're, you're listening, sir. That's what Winston Churchill said. I got these ears for you. Yes. <laughs> terrific. First, the second question. What do you think is your major accomplishment during your tenure as county executive and what do you want, what do you do over, what would you do over again? Okay, major, major accomplishments. Um, it's funny, I was talking about this with someone the other day. You know, in your first year, you, you're just getting there and you're dealing with some of the things that came through. I don't know if you remember, we had about a $15 million projected deficit in our very first year, so we had to deal with how we we're going to help with that. So it took a while. And so now we're starting to think, see some things actually happening that I think are really awesome. Uh, one is the nonprofit center. And now it's great. Not, the county government that, that's technically responsible for that, but we helped out with getting that to happen. And if you're not familiar with it, it's over on uh, uh, where uh, Patuxent Woods, I guess it is, but where Snowden River Parkway hits Broken Land Park, where you go straight across from Snowden River, where we now have uh, the Hope Works is there, uh, Housing Commission is there, and a lot of our other uh, uh, nonprofits, the Autism Society, Compass, which helps folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities find employment. Uh, Camp Attaway helps young people who have emotional issues. And a lot of really great people come together. And what's so nice about it is when they go get copy, they should talk to each other, each other. When they go to the break room, they talk to each other because they share conference rooms, they share the break room, they share the copier. So now they all have this synergy. What's going on over there? I can help you with that. And, and they're all working together. And it's great for people who need those services. They go to one place. But what's really good about that is that by the end of this year, we're hopeful, uh, and the council has been very supportive, and I appreciate that, is that we're going to make it actually the Howard County Community Resources Campus. We'll be moving Community Action Council there, and also we've been working with the state of Maryland, and they've agreed to move the Department of Social Services there. So that's going to be two whole buildings in that area for Department of Social Services. So now, if you have to go to Social Services, it's the same place you go to the Community Action Council, same place for the nonprofit, our housing uh, department will be there as well, as well as our Department of Community Resources and Services, which includes our Department of Aging and Independence. So all of our basic human service needs are going to be in the same location. So you can literally, it'll be on a bus route, you can take a bus, stop in the parking lot, and literally walk anywhere in those five buildings and get all the services you would need in Howard County. To me, I think that's an awesome thing to have in Howard County. It's something that people have been wanting for 20 more years, and I think it'll help folks be able to be home with their family more because they won't be running all over the county when they're trying to get these services because I believe that's the most important thing is to have people home and to be with their kids. My dad was a single father and he was home every night uh, but a lot of folks have two or three jobs they're trying to make things work this will help them be able to be home more with their kids and I think that'll make a big difference. So that's one of the accomplishments. Uh, another one I think the courthouse working on that is, is a big deal for Howard County. We've been wanting to have that for many 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 years. Uh, I also believe that the, the, the preservation of the Tubman building. That's something that's very dear to my heart. If you're not familiar with the Harriet Tubman School, it was the last segregated high school in Howard County. It closed in 1965 when they opened up Atherton High School, just right next door to it. And for many, many years, it's been used as a building services for the school system. And many, many years, people have been saying, we need to figure out a way to save it. And so working with the Harriet Tubman Foundation, certainly working with the school system, certainly working with the county council, 
we have been able to get the funds necessary to, to, to purchase a building where they can move their resources into another building and we can save that location forever and ever and ever and it'll be an African American Cultural and Education Center because I firmly believe that you cannot let anybody forget what people have done in the past because Howard County was not always the most accepting place in Maryland or in the world. Now we might be the best place to live in America but back in the 50s it wasn't that way and I hate to say it but it wasn't. And I don't want anyone to forget that because when you forget it, then you're doomed to maybe repeat it. And I want to make sure that people know that. Um, um, I, I really, I'm sure there's many things I've done wrong. I can't really think of something now to tell you how, how we need to, I need to improve. Uh, but I'm sure there's many, many ways. Frankly, we could have Mary Kay come up. I'm sure she could point out a few. Um, <laughs> But, um, but no, no, so I, I, I know there's a lot, a lot I can do better, and I'll, I'll try to do better. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Third question. Do you disagree with any of the conclusions of the Spending Affordability Assessment Committee? That's for you, Steve. What will be your major focus that you will pursue with their recommendations? Now, first of all, let me tell you, I, Steve Sachs deserves a lot of credit for taking on a task that is not easy. Uh, to get those 23 folks together, and they're all really good people. And again, uh, I'm the first county executive to make sure that every council member had a person on that committee. I think it's important that we have buy-in from everybody. Uh, and so I thought it was, they, they do great work. Um, I know the transfer tax. I understand the rationale for that. I'm just not there yet. Uh, you know, people come to me and say it's hard to buy homes anyway in Howard County. If you increase the closing costs, it makes it even harder. So that's the heartburn for me is not, I don't want to make it harder for people to buy a home in Howard County. But I understand the rationale. I really do. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the ambulance fee makes a lot of sense to me as well, and, and, our, and our fire chief, I think, is really seriously working on trying to figure out a way if we can make that happen, because what happens with that, just so you make sure you know, because some people are saying, oh my gosh, why would we charge people who can't afford to pay it, have to pay it for the ambulance? They don't get charged. The insurance company gets charged. If the insurance company does not pay, we do not send a bill to the homeowner or the person, the, the, the patient. They, they don't have to pay, and that's how almost every jurisdiction does it. So nobody would have to pay if they didn't have insurance, or nobody would have to pay if their insurance didn't pay. But frankly, there are a lot of insurance companies who pay it all the time, and, and Steve is right. And I was talking with some volunteer firefighters the other day, and it's probably true, even when our ambulances go somewhere else, because we do, we do joint aid, or, go to like Carroll County or Anne Arundel County, they probably charge an insurance fee for our ambulance going to their county to help their patients. So, um, so we should certainly be looking at that too. So, yeah. Sir, because you answered the first three questions very nicely, I present you with oh, a bottle of you. water. Thank you. Thank you. Fourth question. What is your major concern? I guess I'm, who's, who wants to be a millionaire or something, you know? Okay. What is your major concern regarding this year's budget? My major concern regarding this year's budget. Yes. Um, I, I, do, I am concerned about uh, borrowing. Um, now, I think we had to put the money in for the courthouse. That's a requirement. Uh, we're trying to do that public-private partnership. Uh, the council has looked at this tremendously, and so is the Spending Affordability Advisory Committee. We've hired consultants on that, and they basically have come back to us saying you need $105 million to put in your, your capital projects. Now, that's a whole lot more than we could put in one year technically, but we decided to go ahead and put it in at one time so we have it there uh, so we can make it work because you're never going to be able to find that money if you just don't do it. Uh, Chuck Ecker used to have a saying. If you gotta eat a frog, eat it all one bite. <laughs> and so uh, we're eating it all in one bite and we're trying to get this done. And so that's a difficult thing for this budget, but it's important. I'll tell you why it's so important. Uh, we're looking at having maybe 60% uh, county funding or, uh, and 40% private funding. We're looking at the proper number there uh, to make it work, uh, but we have to have a buy-in from the, the council's already approved a resolution. I'm supporting it and they'll be voting on the capital budget soon. It's important that we have that 105 million there because that will get us the best bidders in the world or the country to come here. Now, we've had folks go to Dallas for a courthouse pu uh, public-private partnership conference and almost everybody there says, Nobody seriously will bid unless they know that the legislative and the executive are together, that the money is there, and it's going to happen. They just don't want to put, it might cost them a million dollars to put the bid together. It's a $138 million project. So we need to make sure we have that buy-in. And so that's a little bit 
difficult knowing that we have to put that money in there. Uh, and also just the fact that uh, Steve told you 85 million is what they recommended. Uh, we're doing about 96, I think it is, this year. Uh, we've always kept it less than 100 since I've been in office. Uh, and, and the problem was, as he told you, the two years before I was in office, was 120 both years, at least authorized. Um, and even though we could have said, hey, the money was less expensive then, we don't issue the bonds that year. So you don't know when the bonds will be issued. And so it does, didn't make much sense for us to do that back then. So we're trying to get ourselves back down. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to ask the audience something, because um, I want to make sure that you all are fully engaged. But we have a time, time constraint, because uh, we're going to wrap up at about 9.30. So I'm asking you, do you all want to have one, and only one, follow-up question to Mr. Kittleman? Yes or no? You all want to do that or not? No. Oh, that's great. Great. I just want to make sure everybody's happy. This is like speed dating. I'm going to just go boom, boom, boom. Okay, good. That's great. Terrific. I appreciate it. Okay. Mr. Kittleman, will our tax base be able to keep up with our continuing growth without an adverse effect on schools and other infrastructure, or do you foresee a need for a tax increase? Uh, I don't foresee a need for a tax increase right now. Uh, we certainly are able to keep up right now. Um, the, the, the question... Hello. Hello. I don't know who that was. Okay. Um, there's, there's spies in here. But, but we, we, I mean, we look at it every year, and we, and we try to give an idea of where we're looking in the future. But that's the reason why I think Steve made the good point about our commercial tax base. The more that we can have a strong commercial tax base, the less pressure is on our residential property tax. And that's why we need to make sure. That's why I think the Columbia Gateway, where we want to make it the uh, Howard County Innovation District, could really be a great benefit to Howard County. Because if we can develop that to be a real strong economic engine where we can have a whole lot more job development there and job creation and, and more commercial taxes, then that will reduce the burden on us to have a property tax increase. Because uh, as I think I've told you guys before, there's no way our residents pay enough to cover our school system. They just don't. I mean, for what we use. I am a father of four. The county spends actually more than this, but let's say $10,000 a year per pupil. So that when my kids were in school together, that means the county was investing $40,000 a year for my children to have an education. I did not pay $40,000 in property taxes. But we have to have something to help us with that, and that is the commercial tax base. And so I think what we need to think about is how can we make that tax base stronger so that we can relieve that burden of our personal property taxes. Yeah. Next question is, is there a real vision in our county? What is it and how are you seeing that it remains a continuous reality now and in the future? Oh, I, I definitely think that, well, I think that Howard County Citizens Association has a vision. I hear about it all the time. And, and from Stu Cohn. Um, I know our, our council members, all of us, we have, we have a vision for making Howard County, you know, the best place to live in America to make sure that we have the resources available for everybody to make sure our school system is world class. Now, you don't do that by just staying status static. You've got to make sure you continue to improve. So the vision is to make sure that we have that commercial tax base, so that we have the ability to pay for the things that we need to have, so we can have the best teachers. You know, my father used to tell me, you know, bricks and mortar are one thing, but a teacher is the most important thing in the classroom. I mean, you, my dad used to tell me he'd rather have a good teacher with 50 kids in the classroom than a bad teacher with 10. And, and so we need to make sure that we can provide those resources to our teachers to make sure they're the best. So, so the vision we have, at least that I have, is to make sure that we have a place where people are going to want to continue to come here as opposed to leave here. And I know that causes some pressure for us and it causes some challenges for us. But I tell people all the time, I'd rather have the challenge and the pressure of want, people wanting to live here than the challenge and the pressure of how to keep people to stay here. And so we're very fortunate where we are. So that's how I think we need to continue to move forward. Okay. Uh, there's more pizza back there, and we have cookies, and uh, I don't want to have to take everything home. Thank you. Um, do you think there are inconsistencies through press releases and public statements? For example, downtown Columbia, Columbia Gateway, and Route 1 are all three described as the quote-unquote economic engine of the county. Can we really have multiple sites without creating competition between the three and detracting from areas like the routes one and 40 quarters. 
Oh, you got to have more than one economic engine. You have to have it. You have to I only ask questions, sir. I know. Well, I didn't, I didn't say you're wrong. Uh, well, but no, we have to. We have to have as many as we possibly can. You left out Maple Lawn. I mean, Maple Lawn's a tremendous economic engine for Howard County. So to say that they're economic engines is accurate. Uh, we need to have as many as we can possibly find. Uh, Route 1 continues to be one. A gateway is just the one that people are talking about now because there's so much, 900 acres of land, 900 acres of land at the 95-175 intersection. That is a tremendous opportunity for us. And again, an opportunity for us to make sure that we have the amenities and the resources that our residents demand uh, by making sure that goes forward. But you, know, you can have multiple economic engines. Okay. What change in the county charter could bring the public school system under greater county scrutiny and supervision. Having one entity, the county government tax, and other HCPSS spend without regard to where the money comes from is clearly not working well for us. Well, the Department of Education is a state agency. And the county cannot do anything in our charter to prevent them from doing what they're doing. We don't have that authority. Now, those in the state legislature, you're welcome to tackle that if you'd like to. Um, but no, we don't have that ability. Uh, under state law, we have the ability to provide them funds in a category. They have the complete authority to decide how to spend. Right, doctor? So we'll make sure you're there. Um, they have the authority to spend within those categories as they see fit. Uh, the one thing we have going for us that some jurisdictions don't is we have an elected school board. Those individuals represent you just like I do. And so uh, the goal is to make sure that we elect people in the school board to help us facilitate that. Yeah, Mary Kay. So, and I also want to Speak loudly, point. though. So, yeah. I do. I want to make a point for everybody because there is real confusion on this one. By state law, Allen and the council cannot substitute our uh, priorities for the Board of Education. So we have no authority, and that's what's really, really important for yeah. people to understand. Right. We could just put it in the category, and they decide how to spend it inside a category. We cannot tell them you must spend on this project. Here. Did you want to say something, Steve? Well, I'd be glad. I'd be uh -huh. glad to we, we tackle this. What's coming over? I'm sorry, Mary, you probably should have had that thing. We hit this to a degree, as Mary Kay knows, after we did the school board, not school board, the courthouse, Mary Kay asked a question during that meeting, said, how can we afford to do all this? And we got back, our group, we had five people presented to the council. We went outside and we said, when are we going to hit the elephant in the room? And the elephant in the room is expenses within the county. And the fact that 62% of that is the school uh, board of education, another 3 or 4% or 5% is the college and, and, and HCC. And we also, one of our recommendations was that we do basically a, a structural uh, stress test for the county and do that on a periodic basis. The problem is, and it's got to be voluntary for just the reasons Mary Kay said, that the, all the stakeholders work together to sort of open the windows and look for ways to do things. I had this question for the leadership, Howard County, and they said, we agree with what you're saying, but what do you do? And I said, our role in spending affordability is not to be prescriptive, but I've lived here 40 some years, and I believe there's enough intellectual capability and capacity within the county to figure this thing out, but it requires everyone to work together and figure out how do you work smarter, how do you work better, without, without in any way taking away the quality of education. And that's the challenge. It's really tough when you have 39, 38, 37 million dollars in new revenue coming in and you have the school system requesting 64 million in new revenue. You just can't do it. It's just not possible. And so we have to figure out ways in which we can make it work. Thank you. What will you and the county do to ensure your constituents are fully protected regarding Meriwether Post Pavilion? decibels be turned down by making sure the law is fully enforced. HCCA is extremely proud that we worked with our elected officials and Governor Hogan signed the bill. How are you coordinating enforcement protocols by county police, health, and IT departments? Now that the county's Downtown Columbia Arts and Culture Commission owns MPP, what additional powers and liability does the county have? Good question. I had no idea that would come tonight. Um, <laughs> Maria. Um, no, I, I, once, the, once the legislation was passed, I actually asked our health department to start monitoring it right away. 
So we got to start seeing where it was with the new levels so that we could start letting Meriwether Post know, hey, you know, you're already violating this, but come June it'll be a, a violation that you'll have to pay for. So start looking at that. It's my understanding that the health department found actually one concert already went over the level. Uh, and so they contacted Meriwether and told them, we're just letting you know that this one was over the level. You need to be, get, get that down. And, and I think that they either acted that night or they, or, they, or they at least advised about that. So we will continue and we will make sure that the health department, I've asked them to, to monitor it, to make sure we look at those levels, and we've already started. And so that's what we will continue to do. Um, with DAC, I don't think there's anything different there. I mean, they're a nonprofit. Uh, we don't control the DAC. And so well, they'll be the owner and they'll be the ones we'll be contacting. It makes more sense to probably contact Meriwether initially because they're the ones with the switches to make the, the sound go down. But, but we'll be working with them and we'll continue to make sure that the, the law is followed. And I want everybody to know this is not just Meriwether. This is any outdoor venue. Mm -hmm. So the chrysalis is involved as well. No problem. We will, we will make sure it's monitored. Okay. And I want to say also that uh, Dr. Mara Rossman, who couldn't come here tonight, She's the director of the health department. Uh, she told me personally that she will try to do everything under her power to make sure that the people are happy. Good. She told me to make sure I say that. So tell her I said that. I, I will tell her you said Thank that. Thank you. Next question. Do you have any concerns about the usage of TIFFs based on recent litigation from developers regarding the Columbia TIF? Are there any changes to these types of plans you feel should be made to avoid future litigation, especially if you plan on supporting this instrument for Laurel Park with its proposed 1,000 units? Uh, I think TIFFs are a very useful tool. Uh, Howard County does not use them willy-nilly. Uh, we've only had two now uh, in Howard County's history. I think if, it's, if it meets the uh, requirements, I think it's something we should do to encourage development and encourage economic growth. So I do think they're, they're fine. I certainly cannot discuss the pending lawsuit. That's not appropriate for me to discuss tonight. Um, but, you know, I think if someone presents an application, we will review them. And if we think it's the best interest of the county, we will certainly recommend it. And they will go to the county council for their review and their approval. So there's a long process to get through. You don't get a TIF like just having someone say, go for it. Um, but I think they are useful too. A lot of other jurisdictions use them. Andrew Runa County uses them a lot. Uh, and so we've only used it twice. Uh, and I think we're, pre we're pretty careful about that. Uh, but if uh, folks in Laurel want to come to us with an application, we're certainly open in to consider it. Mary Kay, you want to say something? I do, because there's a misapprehension that we give them out really know. I want everybody to know that under the last administration, there were requests for tests that were in fact turned down mm. because they couldn't meet uh, <coughs> kind of financial uh, requirements. Yeah. So they couldn't generate the income that they were asking to borrow. So we turned, they've been turned out and not come to the council because they just wouldn't pay it. And, and also, if I could just, on a different note, I, I just noticed Jackie Scott is here. She's our acting director of our Department of Community Resources and Services, who will be moving to the campus down at the nonprofit area. So thank you for being here, Jackie. Okay, next question. But don't answer it until, until I say something afterwards. <laughs> how, can, how can AFO be improved and what recommendations will you make in this endeavor? Additionally, many residents are concerned with the overdevelopment without ample infrastructure at the same speed. What is your thought on this issue? But before you answer that, uh, I want to introduce someone myself. And that is an individual who I've had the pleasure of being on two task force. Uh, one was the DPZ transition team that uh, Alan uh, assigned us to. And uh, the other is the uh, APFO task force. And it's Mr. Cole Schnorf, you want to stand Cole? Mm -hmm. Who I got to tell you unequivocally, <laughs> he, is the, he was the best chairperson that I've ever experienced in my life. And I want to thank you for that Cole. Mm. You can pay me later, <laughs> much later I'm sure. No, I do want to thank all the members of the task force and Cole Schnorf and uh, Diane Michaelis as well who co-chaired it. Uh, uh, you got to be careful. Steve Sachs is a really good chairman, too. So I've never experienced him. He's probably, he's probably glad of that. <laughs> um, well, well, we've had a lot of discussion about the AFO. Um, we are looking at the recommendations. Basically, the recommendations of the committee, we agreed to put into legislation, and we've had it already to planning board, right, Val? Went to planning board once. And so now we're, we're planning to have it be filed with the, with the county soon. Uh, there are a couple things there that we, um, 
we're told by the Office of Law that we had to get state approval for. Uh, we're looking at other ways that we can get around some of that and try to make it work and have it go to the county council. Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's a difficult. And when you get that many folks together, we had people from all walks of Howard County, all different areas, all different stakeholders. And there were a lot of recommendations that were either unanimous or like maybe only one person dissenting. And so we took all those. I don't think there's one that we didn't include in the legislation we're putting together. So we're basically going with what the task force recommended and, and we'll continue to do the best we can to, to try and make sure the infrastructure is there. It's just, it's just difficult because people do have property rights and so you can't just simply say you can't do anything with your property. And so we have to figure out how we can have that balance done, so. Okay. And that leads into a good, I think a good follow-up question to all this. Will you support quality of life for all citizens of Howard County and include police, fire, EMS, and the hospital as part of the criteria measurement in APFO, especially when they are identified in Plan Howard 2030 in Chapter 8, Public Facilities and Services. We too often hear from our elected officials there is nothing we can do regarding the hospital because it is a private entity. However, as was mentioned tonight, it ceases to become private when the county is providing the hospital with 1.2 million over the next four years. Okay, well, let's talk about the hospital. I think that's the best example. Uh, I, I will, I wonder if you wrote that question. No. No, okay. <laughs> what makes you think that's I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I've never talked to you about this issue. Um, <laughs> you, you, you can't make our development dependent upon the hospital. You just can't. I mean, the fact that we're donating one, or we're helping them with 1.25 million, they're putting a whole lot more in. And they're looking at an expansion of a $45 million expansion project. We're not giving them $45 million for that. Uh, we may be working with them a little bit in a couple of years trying to help them with that. And so to, to tell somebody, again, property rights, uh, you have property, but you're not going to be able to build on that until the Howard County Hospital decides to expand. But that's totally on their dime, and, and no one can tell them to expand. So you just have to sit here and wait. We would have a lawsuit and immediately saying that we are taking somebody's property without just compensation. So, so you, you just can't. You just can't. I mean, we, we do the best we can with the schools and the roads tests, and I really don't think it's appropriate right now to, to do the rest. And I think that's probably what the AFO committee also determined. So, yeah. I know you don't agree with me still. <laughs> I still love you, man. Okay. <laughs> then, then you have a problem, sir. <laughs> I know your wife told me. No. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Yes, we won't go into that. Okay. And she's here tonight. <laughs> uh, is the rate of growth in the county commensurate with the ability to care for our residents pertaining to health concerns to ensure our only hospital is fully prepared now and in the future? I think it's almost a redo of the last one. So I'll just tell you, okay. we're doing the best we can. I don't know what else to say other than what I said last time. Yeah. While it is a relief to see the process of assessing and rewriting the development regulations begin, this is optimally a three-year process. What, if anything, can be done to protect communities, critical environmental areas, along waterways and historic sites in the interim? Well, we're certainly carefully looking at that. If I can ask maybe Val to respond to you that one, because that's, that's more on his level, and he might have more detail about that, on what you can do to protect those things. I mean, there's already regulations. I mean, there you go. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the critical things that we're going to be looking at. Um, some of you may know that we've uh, just begun a process to rewrite the development regulations, excuse me, in, uh, in Howard County. And um, as Stu said, it's going to be about a three-year process. Um, we've reached out. We've had so far, I think, 16 or 17 community meetings, uh, three major um, public events. and. Um, in June, we're going to be posting a questionnaire on our website. So the, the goal really is to reach out to the community, find out you know, what works, what doesn't work. In, in the meantime, um, you know, in Ellicott City, there was a recent uh, a council bill that changed the, the uh, stormwater management requirements in Ellicott City. Uh, we're reviewing everything very carefully, but really the, the focus needs to be on uh, the rewrite of the code. Uh, until that time, it's really hard to say, you know, what kinds of changes we'll see. But you know, so far, uh, we've got something like 500 comments uh, from these various meetings. We're going through those. We're sorting them. We're categorizing them. Uh, that information is going to be posted on the website, and I'm sure there's an environmental category there as well. There is. Thank, thank you, Val. Also, I want to thank Val. I know he meets with you regularly, right? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and say it? you better than me? Yeah. 
Yeah, HCCA is very, very fortunate. We have a, a very, very good working relationship with DPZ. And not only that, when I say HCC, I'm not just talking about the board of directors. We have about four people representing uh, various uh, parts of the county. Uh, Ted Mariano, Brenda Stewart, uh, guy over there, <laughs> Mr. O'Hara. <laughs> yeah, O'Hara. O'Hara. And uh, they, uh, they actually are terrific spokespeople, quite articulate. They know the zoning like other parts of their anatomy, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, I tell you what, I got to tell you folks, I'll tell you right now in public, I respect the heck out of these individuals here because we, we, we communicate online and everything and it's great. And working with DPZ uh, has, has, been, has been really good. Uh, you have to talk um, and, uh, and communicate. You're not going to get everything you want and I don't expect to get everything I want. But there has been some things that we have re received that without talking, we never would have. So Val, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and just, to re just to add on to that, that was one of the real things I wanted to do when I came as county executive was to make sure that we had more communication and more accessibility to DPZ because what I heard for the year or so or two years I was running was the fact that DPZ was not uh, uh, available and the people weren't available, uh, able to talk and I know Val's goal was to really make sure people understand the process better uh, even to have you know training if you want to call it such for people to be able to understand better the processes so they could be more involved and I, and I really appreciate the way that he and also Amy our deputy work with the community so thank you yeah. okay and the next question I swear is not from me <laughs> if the Clarion company does a complete assessment on planning and zoning and the code of the Howard County with an outcome of re recommended changes, what is the estimated total cost of this service? What was the cost of the three introductory meetings Clearing Company made already? Will our contract be written up with an allowable termination contract written into such an endeavor? Is there a ceiling to the amount of money that will be spent on this project? That's got to be you, Val. I have <laughs> Which is actually a good question. Stu, I told you tonight, you know, because I'm not feeling well, I'll agree to anything. No. <laughs> when I'm trying to make you worse. Okay, thanks for being here, Val. <laughs> I'm trying to make you worse. Um, gosh, uh, to answer your question about contracts, I, I really can't answer that. I, I have to talk to our purchasing department on how contracts are structured. Uh, our, in, uh, again, the code rewrite process is in two phases. Um, the first phase is to do an assessment of what's working, what's not working with our existing uh, codes, our zoning regulations, our subdivision regulations. We're reviewing um, plans that, in effect, become regulations like the Route 1 design guidelines. Um, so that portion of the project, I, I think our contract is right around $225,000, something like that. What we hope to do is at the conclusion of phase one, we, that we've got this contract split up, we're going to go into phase two, which is the actual writing of the development regulations. Uh, we're going to open that up to competitive bids. Uh, Clarion and Associates are consultant on phase one. They'll have an opportunity to bid on that as well. Uh, there's no guarantee on who's going to get that work. I think one of the outcomes of phase one is going to look at, okay, what have we discovered as a result of the work that Clarion has done so far? And that will give us a sense of, well, what's it going to take financially to be able to do that? So can I come back at the conclusion of phase one to answer your second part of the question? Absolutely, sir. Okay, good, good. Yes. Okay. Now that the BRX zoning has been removed from the council because of major concerns by the members of the Greater Highland Citizen Association and HCCA, do you think any other of the 41 zoning types should be eliminated? For example, TNC is a continuous zone that has never been used and it is constant state of requested amendments. I'm sure there are places that need to be uh, removed. We need to make it a little more simple, simple. But I also want to put credit where credit is due with Val, but also with Mary Kay and Greg Fox with the BRX. I know they worked very closely and, and worked on that to make sure that happened. So thank you, Mary Kay and, and Greg Fox. Um, 
But no, I mean, I'm sure there is, that's what the whole rewrite's about, is to go through it and try to figure out which one's thin. Okay, she wants us to get rid of CEF. Write that down, please. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. I'd like to fine tune it. Okay. <laughs> okay, next question. Has your stance in any way changed from your campaign promise that industrial mulching on agriculture preservation, mm -hmm. which includes both county and state, should never happen? How can we be assured of enforcement of regulations regarding illegal mulching activities, mm -hmm. the current fines or peanuts, to those who profit from disobeying regulations? Uh, no, my, my stance has not changed. I, I live on an agricultural preservation farm. Uh, I don't believe that there should be industrial mulching on that. Uh, we did, though, put together a small work group, and I know Ted is here. I don't think Rick, I didn't see Rick here tonight. I knew John Tagueras is over here, but he wasn't part of the work group, but he was part of the bigger work group before. Um, and then we had two folks from the agricultural community, and they basically worked out almost everything, I think. And so, been working with Mary Kay and Greg Fox, and um, and so there's a ZRA going in where there won't be industrial mulching on agriculture preservation properties. I think the only exception was for a tree farm. At the most it could be is two acres, nothing higher than that. And that was for folks who actually are a tree farmer. Um, I know Rob is here long and he talked to me. We met the other day and, and John Tagueras was there and others to talk about the issue across the street from him. And I know they'll be working on the violation there, possible violation. I know that's a pending. Val told me it's still pending, but I know you told me that you heard some things the other day. So, so we're working on that to make sure that things are done properly. But no, I still believe that. I think that you know, agricultural preservation should stay agricultural preservation. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why I also didn't really support the 75 acres of solar on agricultural preservation. I wasn't sure that was the best thing to do as well. Uh, so that's where I stand. Thank you. And I want people to know that when it comes to the mulching, uh, we HCCA were one of the members of the task force, and uh, we spent 24 meetings on this. So it's not something that you can just sneeze at. Uh, I learned a lot. Now, speaking of solar, it's a good, lead, good uh, segue, sir. Do you have any concerns about the large area of farmland allowed to be used for solar activities on agriculture preservation properties? You must be a soothsayer. Karnak. Karnak, yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the limit recently set is extremely high and much higher than other jurisdictions at up to 70 acres. If not, why not? Okay, as I just said, I don't support, I didn't sign the legislation. Um, no, I, I don't think it should be that high. Um, and the other thing that, you know, I should let you know are those who might have agricultural preservation properties. We actually recently talked to our office of law about this and some of our, uh, our bond council because, of course, we use tax-exempt bonds to purchase uh, those properties. Uh, we have been advised that a solar farm would violate the tax-exempt bonds. And so if somebody is currently getting paid, for example, my father got into the program in 1992. His estate, where my sister, my brother, and I are being paid that now. Now it'll be done in 30 years, so it'll be 2022, it'll be done. But until that happens, the county has to advise anyone who has an agricultural preservation property they cannot do a solar farm because that would violate, of course, according to our bond council, uh, the tax exempt bonds. What would have to happen is we'd have to sell tax, taxable bonds and replace that with the tax exempt. It would cost the county some money. And so we actually have been putting out a policy uh, to let folks know that we're not going to accept that. Uh, they will not be able to do that because we also have an a, a interest, an easement interest on those properties uh, as a county. And so it's not in the best financial interest of the county to have that happen if we have to go to taxable bonds. So, yeah, so, so that's, that's where it is right now. And, and I wish it could be kept smaller, but the legislation did pass. Yep. Uh, why, why, me. why didn't the Office of Law advise you of this early on? This issue was raised very early in the process, and somehow the Office of Law ignored it. What was the rationale for just, just passing over this big problem? I can't give you that rationale, because um, I found out about it later and talked to them about it, and we got the inf information we have now. So, but I think it's okay, as long as we got it now. I mean, regardless of what the legislation is, we can say, because we hold the interest in the easement, uh, we can say we're not willing to let that happen, and so. Would it apply to malfeasance as well? No, that's the state. So it's just the county We don't have any authority over the state. Bond was issued. And they're still being paid. Yes. They're still being paid. Yep. Okay. Since Columbia's 50th anniversary celebrations continue to praise Jim Ralph's vision, 
Why were the rules changed to allow new buildings along Brook, Broken Land and Little Patuxent Parkways to be so much closer to the street than those built by the Rouse Company? Well, the ones that have been built right now, I think most of them were in the process before I even got in office, but um, I think the one you're talking about probably is MedStar. That's the one that's that, close. That's correct. That's one of them. Um, and I believe, I think when Val, when you came in, you're already, it was already in the process. When you can explain it for me better. It was already being done before we even started. Yeah. So, so again, um, all of that was based on one, the downtown Columbia plan and all of the, and also the design guidelines for each one of the downtown uh, areas. And uh, the, the building setbacks range anywhere from, I, I think it's uh, something like 15 feet to, to or, or 25 feet to 50 feet back of the curb line. So those are all done as part of uh, implementing the design guidelines. So uh, to move to a different standard now would require revisiting the downtown Columbia master plan and also the design guidelines. So those were all basically in place before we arrived. And there's nothing more you can do about that? Not, not for that building. I mean, we could look at future well, buildings, yeah. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. we, we would appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what does DPZ and the county plan to do regarding the missing NT comprehensive sketch plans and the impact that this has on the zoning process. Again, this, this is more you than me. I'll be happy to sit down. I'll be here. I'd be happy to do your next, <laughs> next town hall meeting, Alan. Uh, so um, so uh, one, one of the issues that was raised was that, um, well, number one, um, I, I was interviewed for the 50th film, and uh, one of the things that I stressed was that Columbia's development process is unique and um, it's probably one of the only um, one like it in the entire country. So we have, uh, when, when the plan for Columbia was developed, and, and Cy probably knows this better, uh, a PDP revision is the first step. Uh, the next came the comprehensive sketch plans and then the final development plan. So. Um, we were looking for the comprehensive sketch plans because they're referenced in modifying the final development plan. Well, it, it turns out that when the county moved out of the building when it was renovated, um, there was a review of all of the documents. And during that process, somehow those documents were destroyed, the comprehensive sketch plans. Um, we've, we've talked to the Office of Law about that and um, our, our kind of conclusion is that the FDPs reflect the intent of the PDPs, the comprehensive sketch plans, into the final development plan. So, so right now what we have to rely on uh, are the final development plans, which we, we do have. But we have no idea what happened to those documents, but I think it was uh, w whatever happened, and if they were thrown away, destroyed, whatever, um, that her happened during the move. And um, that, that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at uh, as part of the code rewrite is the Newtown District and what kinds of changes need to take place for that as well. And so hopefully through that process we can also uh, help answer this question, uh, not having those. Does it have a significant impact? My sense is probably not because the FDPs are all in place. They specify you know, the kinds of land uses that are permitted, and it provides a general diagram of large bulk parcels in, new, in the Newtown District. So at this point, uh, we just have to do what we have to do. Thank you, Val. We only have three more questions left, and if time permits, uh, we'll open up to the audience. Is that okay, Alan? Sure. Okay. Actually, we only have two, two more. Two more questions, that's all. That's a long question. And this one is, you, you saw it, huh? I'm going to sit down when you read that one. Yes, this is long, <laughs> but this person um, happens to be uh, very passionate about this particular subject matter. It deals with the courthouse. At the Long Reach Village Center, you mention all the people involved in the process and welcome community input, saying you, quote, can never have too much of that, unquote. So why is Howard County skipping a discussion with barely even an internal discussion about the location for the new courthouse. The availability of Dorsey property and a determination to limit costs has been allowed to supersede any discussion of where the most important county civic buildings should be located in terms of visibility and access, and how it could serve as a catalyst for redevelopment. 
Is the county willing to squander how the courthouse could bring a renaissance to Route 1 without even discussing it? What is the long-range plan for the rest of Dorsey property? Will other government services and the nonprofit center be relocated in the Dorsey site? Okay, great. Um, first of all, the courthouse, as a requirement of state law, is an 1839 law, because uh, when Howard County became a separate county, it was 1851, and they were authorizing us to have a courthouse. It says the courthouse must be at or near the county seat, at or near. And so where the Bendix building is, it's two miles as the crow flies from, from Ellicott City. Uh, Route 1 is much farther than that, and Route 1 would certainly not satisfy the state law. Um, and so we have to have it at or near the county seat. So that's why uh, the Bendix site was chosen. Uh, we looked at other sites possibly around Ellicott City and in Ellicott City, and there just really wasn't any place that was that large. You have to have a lot, lot, of, lot of land to be able to do that, and it's land that we already owned, which certainly makes it better for us spending for a billy would tell us uh, to make it less expensive for us to build but we don't have to buy the property so it just made sense to go there um, and, and so that's why we chose that site okay. and the last question that we have written questions in advance is as follows the north side of blander park is now in the planning stage this is the last 200 acre parcel of natural land that will ever have in columbia the south side of the park was bulldozed during development destroying the ecosystem, its impervious parking lots and fields now contribute to increased stormwater runoff and drainage into the bay. What can we do to ensure that the north side reflects a green aesthetic, preserves wildlife habitat, and showcases sustainability principles in Howard County? Okay, um, I would beg to differ. I think the south side looks really good. I think it's really helpful. I think the people in, in Howard County are loving it, and they're using the, f the fields and the facilities. I think it's a really good thing. And one of the things we're going to have on the south side is going to be a playground for all. It's going to be a playground where 80% is going to be accessible for anybody, whether regardless of what intellectual, developmental, or other physical disabilities they might have. I think that's a great thing. I think it's a really great thing. It's going to be over an acre uh, of that type of park. Uh, the north side, that's in future phases, uh, it is supposed to be mostly open and mostly used for passive recreation and things like that. So I think that's kind of what they already have planned for that, uh, but they're doing the, uh, the south side first, and I frankly think it's, it's a good thing for our county. Okay. So we're going to open up now to the floor, and who would like to entertain a question? Rob. Mr. Long. Do you want a mic there, Rob? No, I'm good. Okay. Now, as you know, with my residence, I'm facing the hazard. You have to pick louder because I, I don't know if anyone can hear you. He might want to get on your couch. Yeah. yeah, why don't you come here? here I'll, come, I'll, I'll be Oprah or Phil Donahue for the older folks like me. Yeah. As you know, the Woodbine citizens are faced with a very hazardous situation with an industrial mulch facility that has been found in violation. I was wondering what the due process is for a violation similar to that where the people are endangered by he just had a big fire at the uh, harvest RGI Sunday and like if there was a fire over across the street and I had my 50 acre field of corn over there it blew over and it would take out the farm so what what is the due process for a violation Actually, I'm going to turn back to the zoning I don't know if you know the I know Amy does most of that do you know the due process and requirements well, um, f first, we, uh, before we send out a notice of violation, there has to be an inspection. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't know the details of it. Amy Gowan uh, is heading that up, but my understanding is that is, is in process right now as far as an investigation. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to reach out to you later and provide the details on that. And I will, we met, what, two weeks ago? I don't know how it was, John, when it was. And you provided us more photos, and we provided that. We kept that for our folks. So I know they're doing that investigation. Uh, and, and when there's violation, as I think we advise you, they are fined per day and not, not just one time. And so we'll continue to focus on that. But I, I know they're working on it since we met with you. Okay. Yeah. Who else? Um, Angie. <coughs> Uh, there's been a great deal of discussion, of course, about redeveloping Newtown. There's been talk about redeveloping Route 1 and other communities. I haven't heard anything said about Route 40 and, and my part of Ellicott City. What are the county's plans to pay some attention to our part of the county? 
I think there was some in the past paying attention to it. I think back when Chris Bird was the county council member, I think they did a, a study of that. Um, I'm not aware of any plans immediately, unless, I don't know if Val says he wants to say something here, so I guess he might know something. Here you go. Well, you mean the, the historic part? He talked about Route 40. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on with historic Elegant City and the water and everything I did with stormwater mitigation. Uh, I'm not familiar with anything going on right now with the Route 40. Uh, so I'm not familiar with anything right now. Well, I suggest that you no, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, we do have a certain amount of bandwidth in, uh, at DPZ, so they can't do it all at one time. So, yeah. Who else? Is that? Gary? Yep. Alan, you know my question. What's your answer? <laughs> <laughs> Please, camera. Alan, you know my question. What's your answer? Are you talking about body cameras? That's right. Okay. And you should have seen that we have a pilot program being uh, put out. They're going to do two pilots with two different vendors. I think it's 45 days each, and they're going to put them on uh, certain officers. I think a lot of the community outreach officers and others, and then we're going to, they're going to reevaluate after the pilot program is over. So that's where they are now. So 45 days is I don't know when it starts. I can get that information to you, but I know that it's starting soon, and it'll be 45 days with one, and then they'll do 45 days with another, and they'll figure out which one's the best one to use and, and how they want to move forward. Well, we're, we're going to evaluate after we do the pilot. That's why it's called a pilot. And so as soon as we have that, thank you very much. Who else? Joel? Oh, okay. <coughs> Could you explain? No, no, here, quick. Yeah. Could you explain to a simple citizen how a private company makes money by investing in a courthouse? Sure, sure. The, the way it works is they can, um, they invest into it and then they also own, they don't own it, but they operate and maintain it for us. I think Steve was talking about that earlier. And then they use, then we pay them for 30 years to use the building, but they're required to keep it up. And that's somewhat the, uh, their, their profit they, through that. They, you, pay them, you pay them more than you would pay for maintenance? You, you pay them a lease for it. And, and I'm sure there's some more than maintenance, but I mean, the goal is to make sure that in 30 years we have a building that's just as good as the day it started instead of, unfortunately, the deferred maintenance that Steve talked about earlier. But I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, if, if, you, if you, first of all, what they're doing, they're selling what the, what the concessionaire is doing, is they have investors and it's a fixed income. They're investing in a 30 year, they're going to get a fixed income return based on the contract with the county. What we as a committee saw in the advantage of that is it's de minimis in terms of the cost differential over the 30 years versus the county doing itself, but we're assured of a much better product. The standard set in the, that will be set in the lease and the, and the contract with them, which will be done by attorneys that are expert in these P3 programs, will set standards and accountability that they can lose their investment if they don't comply with it. So we have a, a standard at the end of 30 years that is, diff that is compliant with what it should be in 30 years. And if you looked at things, and I know Mary Kay, we had this discussion, you look at the, like the jail right now, which is another looming issue. And you look at the condition of the jail, which was a county bid because well, you have a bid for the design, you have a separate bid for the construction, and what you end up with in low bid, and I worked for the Rouse Company at one point, and I saw the, what value engineering is when the MBO of that contractor is for this period of time, and so the value engineering takes cost out, which increases cost in the ultimate maintenance of that building. So if you look at the overall value over 30 years, it was the most, and, and we have a lot of smart people who are on this committee who had no, stake in what the hell the decision was, that it was a better value, it was de-risking it for the county, it was ending up with a better product at the end of the 30 years, and it was a real value for us, and created, it wasn't any giveaway, we own it, but we have them responsible for the maintenance and for in the design, when you put them in that place, it incentivizes them to design it in such a way that's going to give a better return and a better life on that building, versus low bidding each piece of plastic or whatever in the building right and i'll tell you it's yeah i'm sorry wait a second a building after that's built this way after 30 years uh, they've been doing courthouse projects all across the country with p3s and this is actually more of a hybrid p3 where it's not all private funding and and i'm just telling you we've heard very good result, result reviews from people talking about how the building is kept up so 
But have you seen one after 30 years, what it looks like? And I've seen one. I don't know what type. Most of the P3's mm -hmm. done. Yeah, probably less than 30 years, but yeah, yeah. More or less. They started out as infrastructures. Most of the early P3's were infrastructures. We, look, we, we looked at and the consultants talked to, I think, in Long Beach. Yeah, Long they did one. Miami. And we can only know at a point in time, is it, does it, or is everyone happy with it? And the reports back that we had was we spent a lot of time with the consultant. They had a financial consultant came in. The committee did a lot of time on investigating P3s. I've seen enough P3s from my other business that I'm in where they've really worked well, where they've been a positive win-win for the government and for the and for county. It's not a boondoggle. I think the sense is if you've got private business in there, it's just someone getting rich. And the reality is there's no, first of all, there's nothing wrong with making money. But if you have the right standards and criteria in there, you can do it in such a way that they make money, but we get a big win on the other side because it takes out some of the inefficiencies that happen. We have great people in this county and great employees, but it takes out some of the inefficiencies that occur within governmental projects. Right. Right. And so, I, and I also tell you that um, if it's $140 million, it would take us forever to be able to do that just by ourselves. I mean, we just don't have the resources to be able to do it that that quickly. Yes, yeah, John. I'll, I'll get you next, Joel. Yeah. Alan, I'm a little confused. We're going back to the, you know, the question that was number 18, I think. Uh, Jim Rouse's vision was kind of unique and it keeps on being referred to in our, during our 50th celebrations. And what concerns me was you, you said, well, yeah, maybe the uh, MedStar building is uh, um, a bit close to the highway, but that was all something that occurred before Val and you were in office, and that yeah, maybe in the future the buildings could be looked at somewhat again, moved back. Then Al said, well, uh, Val said, well, wait a minute, um, the 2010 downtown plan got rid of, uh, rid of any uh, setbacks, and uh, unless we, it doesn't see you going back and changing that legislation anytime soon, so that tells to me that really MedStar is, a, is the model of what's going to happen in the future. And when you look at uh, like the, uh, the apartment buildings on broken land, they're right in the street too. And I don't think that was Jim Rouse's vision. And I think a lot of people in this room uh, thought that downtown would be a green downtown, very different from a typical downtown where the buildings are right up against the sidewalk. And I think that's confusing. Let me remember quick. Um, well, first of all, the 2010 plan was passed, and, and it had all these requirements. So that was decided in 2010 that this would be the way downtown would go. Um, but my point being is the MedStar building was done before we got in there. And I think you even had a conversation with them about trying to change the building around. But they, it was already been put in and already done things. And so what I meant by that was we have the ability now at least to talk to them just because it says this is what the setbacks can be, it doesn't mean we can't talk to them and say, hey, we'd like you to move it back a little bit. We can still have that conversation with them, even though regular. So I think that we've talked about that with them. So, okay. Yeah, I think Joel was next. All right, this will be long again. Um, what can you do to help make the uh, legal analysis regarding the courthouse public? I've requested it through Judge Gelfman's office, and it was <coughs> been denied. Um, because it was privileged for her. Because um, I find so much wrong with that analysis. The 1930, 1839 statute was generally enabling law setting up the Howard District. And if you're going to rely on that one little clause, you're omitting the other 27 or more sections, including the fact that set up a lot of government organizations and details with the sheriff and the clerks and things like that. But it also had restrictions on spending $25,000 on building the courthouse. More importantly, the clause you rely on said that the county commissioners were to select in or near and select a courthouse, a clerk's office, a jail, and a poor's house. The poor's house, or an alms house, as it was defined in the 1800s, was never built. What could be classified most closely to it is the homeless shelter being built in Jessup, not in the county seat. Also, let's go back, that nobody, I think, in 1839 would consider what was almost Columbia to be in Ellicott Mills as defined at the time. The 1868 map puts it on the other side of Hilton, so it's nowhere near that. And relying on the post office zip code, since it's an unincorporated county seat, to define where our county seat is, which is basically one of the largest 
Towson and Ellicott City, the largest unincorporated county seats in the United States. So you're relying on that to find that because the Ellicott City municipal limits between 1868 and, and 1939 were nowhere near that either. So that was, nobody ever would have considered it to be Ellicott Mills back in 1839 being at the Dorsey site. More importantly, the other clause also in there says you're supposed to, the jail was supposed to be built in the county seat as well. And when the jail was moved to, to Jessup in 1983, I believe the county was a stop to be claiming that. Furthermore, you can amend this statute, of course, to get around all that from these problems. Um, it was never codified in the uh, public local laws of Howard County, from what I can find. So it was never treated as a public local law. It was more of an enabling law, of setting it up in 1839 and dealing with it in 1839, 1840. And it didn't really have any effect after that. So I asked, beginning, what, what can we do to get this analysis? public, and second, what's going on with the rest of the Dorsey site vis-a-vis -vis the nonprofit center? Okay. okay, well, I'll just, I mean, I just disagree with you on your legal analysis, too, and all I'm saying is it says there, I mean, we're both attorneys, it says there it has to be at or near the courthouse. I also disagree with you, you're not going by the zip code. If you look at the line of the, of the prior incorporation, because LXC was incorporated for a while, less than two, it's two miles from those lines to where it is now. Third thing I'll tell you, practically, it just doesn't make sense to put the courthouse on Route 1. First of all, you need a large area of land. Secondly, it's not this economic development. Courthouse is not an economic development tool. Downtown Elegant City will tell you that. Actually, having the courthouse move to Bendix will help Elegant City because we'll be able to use the area that's a courthouse now to be something that will be used seven days a week more than just from 8 to 5. Right now, the courthouse in Elegant City is used five days a week, 8.30 till 5 p.m., and everybody goes home. And even the jurors do not go to dinner or lunch or anything in LXC. City. We're told by the courthouse they all drive out to Route 40 and they get their lunches. So having a courthouse is not an economic development tool. Having a courthouse is a resource for our citizens, for people to have. And we need to make sure it's closest to the probably the population centers of Howard County, which is between Columbia and Ellicott City. And so it doesn't make sense to go to Route 1, even if we were allowed to go there. We differ on the legal analysis. Uh, I'm just going by what the, the law says. It says in or, in or near uh, Ellicott City. Who else? Oh, Barbara, how are you? Is that working? I don't know if that's working. Oh, okay. Okay. I want to interrupt this discussion with a commercial message. Okay. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk about just a few uh, subjects, and since this is your, you know, general community meeting, I wanted to do two things. I want to thank you for many of the things that you have done since you were elected. Um, it's always nice when you work for somebody to get elected and they actually do something you like. <laughs> and um, I'm thinking of, uh, for example, in Oakland Mills, uh, the county did not come in and gobble up one more piece of property um, to turn into housing that would have been detrimental to our community. I really appreciate that and all of the other things you've done for Oakland Mills. So uh, that's the commercial part. I, okay. <laughs> I wanted. I, no, 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 no. I don't. I don't think I have anything to ask for. I just want you to continue not to forget us. In, in all of the other um, problems and projects that you have because the older villages of Columbia really continue to need all kinds of attention with our deteriorating housing and, um, and uh, programs are needed to focus on the older yeah. villages of Columbia. So thank you what you've, no, thank for you. what you've done. Thank you, Barbara. And don't lose your focus. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, what Barbara didn't say was when I was on the county council, we worked together, and that, that's yeah. great. Um, but also, I, I tell you, I'm excited about the pedestrian bridge, and I really appreciate uh, working with the Oakland Mills folks because I think that's going to be really good once that's done to be more of an iconic bridge so people will know it's Columbia when they get there and that people feel more safe going across it, which I think will help revitalize somewhat Oakland Mills because people will be more active to go back and forth. Uh, and also with the Renew program that we're working on that, that had, the funds weren't there a couple years ago, but now they are with the help of the county council. And so there'll be money there to help people to renovate their older homes so new people can move in and if they 
you know, wouldn't move in because they have to have a new, new roof, we can help them be able to get the money to put the new roof on so we can have new families coming in because the best thing to do to revitalize an area is to bring in new people and new young people and have families there. So I'm hopeful that all happens. So, yeah. I'm going to allow two more questions, and that'll be it. Susan. Ms. How are you, Susan? I'm good. Can you share with us any uh, predictions on where the new uh, proposed detox center will be located? I cannot share because I don't know. Um, I do tell you we have to have one. Uh, and I know people are going to say, I don't want next to me or whatever, but we have to have one. Just not too long ago, we had seven overdoses in one week, four people died. And I, one of those is a very tragic, I mean, they're all tragic, but one of those, uh, Jack Kavanaugh, our director of corrections, told me they had an individual come in, it's a young woman, who was, uh, who was charged basically with, uh, with possession I, I'm using, and, and then she needed a detox center, she needed a place to go. And so they looked around to find one, they found one, but there wasn't an opening for two days. And so she wasn't kept in the jail, because there wasn't a violation, they could keep her in jail. And so they put her in a hotel room on Route 1, and she overdosed and died. Now, if we had had a location in Howard County, they would have hopefully been able to go over and find. Now, we've talked to Shepard Pratt about their building a new psychiatric uh, off of Meadow Ridge, and we talked about maybe we could join with them and do something there, because that's kind of what they're already doing. We've also talked, I know Steve has left, with the hospital, and maybe putting it on the hospital campus, since that, again, they're already talking about having a psychiatric ward and doing more with that. And so we're looking at different areas there. Right now, Maura Rossman and some other folks in our administration are just looking at it. We put it a couple hundred thousand dollars in this year's budget to help them try to figure out where it's the best place to try to make it happen. But the, the issue is we cannot say no. We have to say yes, we just don't know where it'll be, but we have to have to have one because we have people dying and there are people who are dying. It's not like people from out of county are coming here we're actually going to out of county to get treatment, and that's, we, that's not right. We need, to, we need to serve the folks here. Sai. Si. I'll go this way, Sai. Si. 50 years ago, uh, I had the great pleasure of working with Jim Rouse and Mort Hoppenfeld and some other people, and the big challenge uh, encouraging me to come here in that period was the fact that we were going to build this great downtown park called Symphony Woods. And so 50 years ago, um, I was really, really excited and convinced that we were going to do this because this was one of Jim Rouse's absolutely most important things in his mind was to build a great downtown park. So here we are building all this new commercial development but nobody seems to really, I know he cares. I know that there are a lot of people in the county who care about this, but I just wanted to bring up the fact that it was, in fact, in meeting with Jim Rouse, uh, Mort Hoppenfeld, and, and um, Bob Tenenbaum, who was on the team, these people all know that this was a commitment that he wanted, and I would love to see that built as a celebration to him. And, and I want to thank Cy. Um, I want to thank Cy and, and others. I think Stuart, you were there too, and they came in and met with me. I've met with you a few times about this, and you know, it is, a, I know Milton Stewart, Columbia Association, technically their property, and, and they have the easement to them, so it's something that the Columbia Association, and, and, but you know, right now the chrysalis is done, and so we'll be looking at seeing what's going to be happening next, but I'm certainly open to continue to work with the Columbia Association and others to, to move forward on that. Can I say one more thing before we finish? Because I don't know. You can say more than one, sir. No, I just want to say, <laughs> Um, a lot of stuff's been happening with the school system, as we all know. Uh, but one of the things that happened is that one of our Board of Education members resigned. And so the way our, our law works is, is that the county executive uh, nominates somebody and then the county council either approves or disapproves of that person before they become on the, on the, on the school board. Uh, we put out a, a request for applications. I want to let you know we got 31 applications and really good people really good people we started interviewing today uh, we did I don't know about six or seven interviews today pretty much all my afternoon uh, and you would be very proud and impressed with the people in Howard County who want to be uh, uh, serving and that's the hardest job I think in Howard County is a Board of Education as Mary Kay Signey knows because she served there um, but for what's expected from them uh, and, and how little pay they get frankly and, and, and all that they have to sacrifice 
that is an incredible obligation. And so we're very fortunate that I just want to know we have 31 really committed people to, to be considered. And so we're hopeful to get those done soon. Uh, I'd like to get that down to the council, if possible, by end of May, um, so they can have for June consideration. But I just want to give you that update that, that we have some really, really, really good people. And we're very fortunate in Howard County to have such talent and who want to be part of this community. So, thank you very much. On behalf of the Howard County Citizens Association, HCCA, we cannot begin to say thank you to our guests, and that's all of you, and our guest speakers for coming out tonight and sharing information, because without sharing information, we'd have none. And um, Alan, thank you for answering our questions. Uh, this is being videotaped, and I'll be on your website. So when it's out there, I will be happy to tell you all the link. Uh, you, you, you can go on their website, but I'll put out the link on, the, on our listserv. Um, that listserv, uh, there's over, so you all know, there's over, nearly 300 people on that listserv. Uh, a lot of them, a number of them are elected officials. So they're seeing what's being put out there. I, I know. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you admit to it, sir. Thank you. Um, but um, the next... Uh, HCCA annual meeting uh, will probably be at a different place than this because, uh, as I say, that uh, uh, the county exec has offered uh, us to be a part of his, uh, as is tonight, his um, uh, meetings, uh, town hall meetings. And uh, quite frankly, I think that HCCA, and I know it is, we feel honored that he's using us for that venue. So I want to thank you, Alan. And don't forget, we have the, the film that uh, is going to be award-winning. And uh, I expect everybody in February to be on the red carpet. Uh, but we're going to see you in September. And I'll, of course, go out many times telling you all where it is. It's at Howard County Community College, when, et cetera. And uh, I expect everyone to be here, be there. And uh, as you saw tonight, I hope you saw tonight, uh, how rewarding I think it is. And uh, it means a lot. Uh, it's not put together in a day. So, any event, thank you all for coming. And you can best believe that HCCA will continue to do the endeavor that we try to do. So, thank you. <laughs>